this is grassy wet sclerophyll forest um, on the Dorigo Plateau. There are some very simple visual cues that can let you know when you're in grassy wet sclerophyll forest. Generally there'll be a tall canopy of eucalypts, in this case New England blackbutt and tallowood. Probably not quite as tall as the shrubby wet sclerophyll forest, but still pushing 30 to in some places 40 meters. And a diverse grassy understory. So generally there are few shrubs, although in this particular case there's a smattering, a scattering of shrubs, but a diverse understory made up of now, oh, here's, here's an endemic Dorigo grass, uh, which only grows on the Dorigo Plateau. Uh, some kangaroo grass, uh, snow grass, um, little bits of blady grass amongst it and lamandra. So a fairly thick uh, understory made up mostly of grasses. They're the, the main visual cues that let you know when you're in a grassy wet sclerophyll forest. Because the Dorigo Plateau is so wet, there are only wet sclerophyll forests. It's, uh, it's one of the most elevated landscapes in the country and because of that it gets lots of rainfall. The catchments draining into the Nimboida are the wettest subcatchments in New South Wales. Um, the rainfall here on the Dorigo Plateau is probably only exceeded by in Australia by areas up in the wet tropics around Cairns, Tully, Cooktown, that part of the world. So, um, so within the wet sclerophyll forest you've got the shrubby, which is generally a rainforest understory, and grassy wet sclerophyll forest, which around us is a, is a, a classic example of it. In these Dorigo Plateau grassy wet sclerophyll forests, one of the, the most characteristic species is the New England blackbutt. Um, generally quite a gnarly tree, often quite an angular crown on it, and they, they bear a lot of hollows, so it's really good country for, um, for greater gliders, um, which are quite a sensitive species that only live in areas with lots of hollows. And the other species is the tallowood with a more brown chocolatey bark, and it's a classic um, wet sclerophyll forest species. It can also though live into some of the, the shrubbier types of wet sclerophyll forest. You can see all around us there's a lot of hollows. Most of these trees have at least one hollow. Many of them have numerous hollows and if we were to come spotlighting down here tonight we'd be pretty much guaranteed of spotting um, greater gliders and they love living in the hollows of the eucalypts, so the, the tallowood and the New England blackbutt and they eat the foliage of the eucalypts and particularly the foliage of the New England blackbutt. It's one of their favourite foods. These forests are really interesting because they've got quite a different uh, suite of species to the shrubby wet sclerophyll forests and a lot of the diversity is actually in the small mammals. So because there are lots of grass seeds and sedges and nutritious leaves of native peas, there are a number of really significant and threatened mammals that live here. And on this very site, uh, going back uh, 18 months or so, there were Hastings river mice trapped on this site. This was, a, this was a small mammal survey plot. They're a nationally endangered species which has uh, populations on a few parts of the Dorigo Plateau. Interestingly, national parks had funded work within the adjoining reserves across the course of four years. And in four years, those surveys had only trapped four animals. On this property, in four nights, four different animals were trapped, which really shows the value of these good condition, healthy, grassy, understoried eucalypt forests. Uh, as well as uh, things like the small mammals. Uh, there are copperhead snakes, alpine copperhead snakes, which are um, very, very rare on the northern tablelands and they're in these forests. Tiger snakes, a host of uh, native lizards, frogs. Um, in areas that are more frequently burnt, the vulnerable New Holland mouse has been trapped across the road to our north in an area that was far more recently burnt. And they're a small 
native rodent about the size of a, size of a house mouse, which actually only occupies areas that have been more recently burnt because it feeds upon grass seeds that, uh, that come up quickly after fire. A um, couple of examples here of what, what can happen with fire. Fire is far more frequent in the grassy wet sclerophyll forest than the shrubby. Um, generally a frequency of about every 10 to 50 years is appropriate in these forests. Here's a big stag. It's got some amazing hollows up the top. So there may well be greater gliders or powerful owls or masked owls or yellow belly gliders living in this. Maybe even um, uh, glossy black cockatoos because there's a whole lot of feed trees nearby. And you can see that at least one and maybe several fires have burnt around the base. If fire happens in future and it keeps on burning around the base, there's a great risk that this beautiful habitat tree would fall over and you'd lose all those fantastic homes for, for the fauna. It's really important that if fire is occurring, whether it's wildfire or planned burns, that You've got the resources and the, the, the human power present and that you're prepared to prevent trees like this falling. We're right by a small forest trail here and in the event of fire it would be really important to come in and to put out any fire that might be in burning around the base because if this tree goes you lose a century or more of hollow development. So it's really important to protect the existing hollows. Around us there certainly are fallen logs and fallen logs have value, but um, there'll generally be branches falling off old growth trees which create uh, fallen timber for the, the lizards and the small mammals and certainly Hastings River mice, they love getting in amongst fallen logs. But when fire comes in in a single event, and burns around a tree like this, you, you can't replace that. Once it's down on the ground, it can't be occupied by possums, gliders and owls. They don't, they don't live in, they don't generally live in hollows on the ground. They need hollows that are up there in the canopy. So these uh, mostly grassy understories, uh, a lot of elements to it, so a lot of the grasses uh, um, fairly attuned to fire and some of them require fire to regenerate in that they will uh, germinate after a fire from seeds. Um, there's a classic example here of kangaroo grass. It's also an incredibly nutritious uh, feed for cattle and other stock and it can be grazed out pretty quickly. Um, certainly using fire Periodically in these forests can keep the understory diverse and healthy. Um, you certainly don't want fires every year or every few years, but um, an appropriate regime might be every seven to 10 or 15 years to make sure that the plants in the understory that need fire to regenerate, that need fire to germinate, are given that opportunity. Um, these fires are pro these these fires these forests are probably some of the most widespread on the Dorigo Plateau, and whilst a lot of them are managed for conservation, big parts of the landscape are the forests in big parts of the landscape are managed for grazing, and if grazing productivity is to be maintained, the use of fire needs to be very careful. If fire happens too frequently, as in every one or three years on a very frequent return, you'll find that blady grass comes to dominate and a lot of the diversity of the other far more valuable native grasses such as kangaroo grass can be lost. And you can often go out into the landscape and you'll see a whole hillside of nothing but blady grass and you can fairly reliably conclude that that area has been too frequently burnt. So patchy fire in space and time is the key to maintaining the diversity of these understories to ensure the maintenance of things like this endemic, this Dorigo 
uh, grass which only grows on the Dorigo Plateau and in keeping valuable native grasses for the purposes of grazing because a lot of people do a lot of landowners and managers do use these forests for their productivity and if um, if sites are frequent, too frequently burnt, it's not just a situation of dominance by blady grass and bracken fern, but there's an, a major loss of soil carbon and a, and a decline in soil structure. So the productive capacity of areas that are too frequently burnt is reduced. So the, the stocking rate will drop because the soils aren't anywhere near as healthy, there's less organic matter in the landscape and the, the, the native grassy understory uh, communities aren't as nutritious or as reliable in producing food um, for cattle. Within the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Strategy, the grassy understory uh, eucalypt forests of the Dorigo Plateau are regarded as a statewide conservation priority. These are high elevation areas, the, the lowest elevation would be about 600 metres and the highest elevation grassy eucalypt forests are about 1500 or even 1550 metres with the, the snow gum uh, forests and woodlands on Point Lookout um, and over toward Cathedral Rock. These are incredibly rich and unique ecosystems and management of them for conservation is very important because they provide habitat to a host of plants and animals that basically don't live anywhere else. One of the other really big threats to these grassy understory eucalypt forests, particularly in recent times, has been pasture improvement where uh, these beautiful, diverse, productive understories are blanket sprayed with herbicide, generally glyphosate. They are often then ploughed in and exotic pastures are then sown uh, and fertilised and they require annual fertilisation, often annual fertilisation. These native grassy understories don't require any fertilisation and as long as they're carefully managed in that they're not stocked too heavily and they're not burnt too frequently, they will give reliable productivity for, for the foreseeable future. It all comes down to good management and certainly overly frequent burning, so burning every one year or every th few years is really poor management because the blady grass uh, burns and comes back really quickly after fire, you might get a month to six weeks or a couple of months of green pick from it. After that all you've got is really coarse blady grass and it's no good for cattle. So there really is a, a, a strong case for good and appropriate fire. So not having fire too frequently in these forests is the key to not just maintaining biodiversity but probably maintaining a healthy productive agricultural industry. Thank you.